Here we have a piston that uh, we're going to push some air through this little sort of syringe thing, this uh, insulated cylinder. We're told we have 500 newtons applied to the piston face. It pushes the air through. And what we want to do is find the exit velocity here, the velocity near the piston face, the VP, and the mass flow rate out of the device. And we're going to assume that we're dealing with um, air at 20 degrees C. The, so the way we're going to approach this is we're going to treat this as a compressible flow um, rather than incompressible. And the reason I'm saying that is because the, the exit diameter is pretty small. The piston face is, is pretty small, is um, relatively large. So, you know, even a moderate speed here will end up with a pretty high speed over on this side, right, just from conservation of mass. So I'm anticipating that the flow at this side is going to be at a pretty high speed where compressibility effects will be significant. So I'll, I'm going to treat it as a compressible flow. We'll just see how it turns out. If, it's, if the velocity is low enough, then, you know, I, it's overkill, assuming it's compressible. Um, so we'll just, uh, we'll just assume it's a compressible, and we'll see how it all turns out. And again, the reason I'm assuming it's compressible is because such a, a large area difference between this face and that face that you know even a moderate velocity here will end up with a high velocity there. So the way I'm going to find the exit velocity is I'm going to apply the energy equation or the first law of thermodynamics from a point here to a point there. So let's call this point uh, 1 and this point over here 2. And we'll assume that we're dealing with a quasi-steady flow uh, there's no, it's adiabatic since we're told it's an insulated cylinder. There's no work other than pressure work, one inlet, one outlet. If you go through all that, then the first law will tell you that the specific enthalpy plus the specific kinetic energy coming in is going to be the same as that going out. This just comes out of the first law. You can refer to the notes for how we arrive at that. Okay. And uh, we can do a little bit of rearranging of this. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do, well, let, let me go ahead and just do the, the rearranging. So we'll have H2 minus H1, which is 1 half. Let's see, this will be V1 squared minus V2 squared. One of the things we'll do at this point is we're going to say we're dealing with air. And I'm going to assume the air behaves as a perfect gas. A perfect gas is an ideal gas with constant specific heats. So under those conditions, that change in specific enthalpy is Cp times T2 minus T1. That's a pretty reasonable assumption, assuming a, a constant specific heat, as long as the temperature change isn't more than a few hundred Kelvin. Okay. Now, if you look at that for a moment, um, we can rearrange it and then solve for V2. And in doing that, so I'm going from this equation to the next, one of the other things I'm going to assume is that V1 is a lot smaller than V2. And the reason for that is, again, because of the area difference. The diameter here is 3 millimeters. This is 12 centimeters. So there's a pretty big um, difference in the diameters here, right? So this would be like, what, 120 millimeters? This is 3 millimeters. And then when you look at the area, you have to square that diameter ratio. So really big area difference. So I would expect the velocities to be much different. So I, I'm going to assume that the velocity at 1 is much smaller than the velocity at 2. And so when I rearrange this equation, I'll end up with the following expression. Oops, I've got that backwards. It should be T1 minus T2. OK, so that underlined expression right here just comes from the first law, which starts here. And then I made the perfect gas assumption here. I assume that the velocity at the face here was much smaller than the velocity here because of the huge area difference between the two. Now, the other thing I'm going to assume is that the flow going through here is isentropic. And uh, again, I've talked about this in the, the notes, but um, as long as the flow is internally reversible and adiabatic, then we can assume it's, then that means it's going to be isentropic. So it's adiabatic because it's insulated. Internally reversible is a reasonable assumption because, um, you know, the viscous effects would all be concentrated in a thin boundary layer along the sides. So the inner flow would actually be uh, essentially inviscid. So it would be considered re internally reversible 
the, the process going from one to two. So with that in mind, we can relate the temperatures and pressures using isentropic relations for perfect gas. So that looks like this. You have to refer back to your thermodynamics notes to see where this comes from, okay? So this is assuming isentropic flow and perfect gas. So perfect gas, again, mean it's an ideal gas with constant specific heats. So this can then be rearranged to give the temperature at 2 in terms of the temperature at 1 and the pressure ratio. By the way, when we write this expression, you just have to make sure you're using an absolute temperature over on this side and absolute pressures over on that side. Okay? Because it part of the, the derivation of this relies on the ideal gas law, which uses um, absolute pressures and absolute temperatures. So with this in mind, I can go ahead and substitute this expression in right up here. And then um, we have most everything we need to find the velocity. So T1, we were told if we go back up to the problem statement, you can see it's uh, 20 degrees Celsius. So we want to convert that over to Kelvin. So that's 20 plus 273 or 293 Kelvin. P2, that's the pressure right at the outlet here. Now, one of the things that um, we discuss in the notes is that when you have a subsonic flow coming out uh, and discharging into the atmosphere, the flow pressure right at the exit is equal to the surrounding back pressure. Okay, now we've talked about this for incompressible flows. Well, it's also true for subsonic flows. Okay, so if it's a subsonic flow at the exit, and I know that's going to be the case, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment, but if it's a subsonic flow, which it will be here, then the pressure here will be the same as the back pressure. So the P2 would just be the same as atmospheric pressure, which, again, we need to make sure we're using absolute pressures. It'll be 101 kilopascals absolute. So make sure you're using absolute pressures here. Now, the reason I know that the flow here is subsonic is because it's starting from essentially um, stagnation conditions. It's not exactly stagnation because this piston is moving, but it's a very slow speed here. Remember, V1 is much smaller than V2. And then the flow, the, the channel is decreasing in area. So what will happen is the, the Mach number here will start at close to zero because the velocity is very small. The flow will accelerate. But one of the things you'll learn in the notes is that you can't reach supersonic conditions until you go through a narrow area and then open it back up again. So at best, the flow here would be at sonic conditions at, at fastest, or it'll be subsonic. So we're just assuming that it stays subsonic here at the exit. Again, that's a topic that we'll cover in additional detail when we talk about the effects of area change. Okay, so just at this point, um, we'll just assume that it's subsonic at the exit, and if it's subsonic, the exit pressure will be the same as the surrounding or back pressure. Now to find the pressure at one, which we need here, that's gonna be the pressure applied by the piston, so it'll be the force over the area and then remember, we're using an absolute pressure, so we have to also take into account the atmospheric pressure that's on the, on the face of that piston as well. So the pressure at one would be the, the applied force divided by the piston area, which would be pi d1 squared over four, plus atmospheric pressure, because we're dealing with an absolute pressure here. And when you plug the numbers in for this, the force was 500 newtons right up here. The diameter is 12 centimeters. Atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals, but when you plug in the numbers, this comes out to be 145 kilopascals, absolute. So now that we have T1, P2, P1, we can plug all of those values in up here. The K is the specific heat ratio for air. That's specific heat ratio C sub P over C sub V, which is 1.4 for air. It's a number worth memorizing because we use it all the time. So that's the specific heat ratio for air. So we can plug all those values in, and what you'll get is T2 comes out to be 264 Kelvin. And now that we have T2, we can plug it in here with T1 and Cp. That's another property you can look up for air. Cp, if you look that up for air, is 1,004 joules per kilogram Kelvin. 
at about 20 degrees C. So then what that gives us is V2 comes out to be 241 meters per second. So indeed, the velocity coming out um, at the exit is pretty high speed. Now, just to check compared to the, the Mach number, the, the speed of sound at that temperature of T2 is the speed of sound is KRT, and I'm finding it at, at location two. So again, K is the specific heat ratio. R is the gas constant for air. So the gas constant for air is 287 joules per kilogram Kelvin. That's another number that's worth memorizing. T2, we just found, right, it's 264 Kelvin. So the speed of sound at location two is 326 meters per second. So you can see that the velocity at the exit is an appreciable amount of the speed of sound. So the Mach number at the exit is actually um, pretty significant. So the compressible flow assumption is a reasonable one, plus it's subsonic because the velocity is less than the speed of sound. If you wanted to get the Mach number at 2, you could just take V2 over C2. And I, I didn't work out those numbers, but you could you can show that it's subsonic and greater than uh, 0.3. So compressibility effects are significant and it's subsonic. So that's consistent with the assumptions we made. Now that I have the velocity at two, which was one of the things we wanted to find, the next thing I want to do is find the velocity near the piston face. Okay, so to find the velocity near the piston face, what I'm going to do is use conservation of mass so basically, there's a control volume that looks like this. And I can apply conservation of mass to that. It's deformable because this face is deforming. Here, the velocity is going out. So if I use that control volume, I'll end up with the following kind of expression. So this just comes from conservation of mass. The mass flow rate at 1, where the piston face is, is equal to the mass flow rate at 2. So I can do some rearranging of this. So this will be like uh, diameter at 2 divided by diameter at 1 squared. This will be row 2 over row 1. I can rewrite the density, because I don't have the density, but I do have the temperatures and pressures. So I can rewrite that density using the ideal gas law. Remember the ideal gas law looks like P equals rho RT. So rho is like P over RT. So this would be like P2 over P1 times T1 over T2. OK, so I now know all of this information. V2 we just calculated as being 241 meters per second. The diameters were given in the problem statement. P2 and P1 we found right up here. T1 and T2 we calculated. So the T2 is right there. T1 is right there. So you can plug all those values in. And what you'll find is that V2, V1 comes out to be 0.116 meters per second. Much smaller. So this assumption up here, V1 is much smaller than V2, is a good one because V1 is like 10, or you know, what is it, 12 centimeters per second. V2 is 241 meters per second. So that assumption that V1 is much smaller than V2 is, is a really good one. Okay, so then the last thing that we're asked to do is find the mass flow rate out of the out of the syringe looking thing. So the mass flow rate is just going to be the density at 2 times velocity 2 times area 2. And we have all of these values. Again, we could rewrite the density in terms of pressure and temperature using the ideal gas law. We could write the area just in terms of the diameter. So you can plug in those values and you'll get that the mass flow rate comes out to be 2.27 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per second. So that's the last thing we were asked to find. One other thing that we can do, this is a, um, something that's commonly done for compressible flows just for visualization purposes, is to draw a TS diagram. You might remember those from your thermal course. They're similar to a Mollier diagram, which is a specific enthalpy, specific entropy diagram. But if we're dealing with perfect gases where CP is a constant, then it's equivalent essentially to a TS diagram. And um, if I sketch that out for this problem, this is what it would look like. Let me, uh, let me just kind of sketch some things here. 
and then I'll explain it. Putting everything in, and then I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Okay, so uh, on the TS diagram, this is what it would look like. We're starting at state one, that's near the piston face, where the pressure is P1 and the temperature is T1. And then we go isentropically. Remember, we assume that we had isentropic flow from state one to state two down here. So here's state two is right at this point, where the pressure is P2 and the temperature is T2. T2 is a lower temperature than T1. We know that up here. You can see T2 is 264, whereas T1 was 293. So that makes sense, right? This was 293. This was 264 Kelvin, right? Um, the stagnation temperature corresponding to this is, is up here. We didn't calculate that, but the stagnation temperature would be the highest temperature you would have in the system. We didn't, we didn't bother to calculate that. The pressure, P1, is right up here. This, this pressure curve has a higher pressure than that pressure curve. If you just review what um, TS diagrams are like, so you'll see that curves of constant pressure or isobars look like this in the TS diagram. And so this pressure is actually a higher pressure than that one. And again, if you go back up, P1 was um, 145 kilopascals absolute, whereas P2 is 101 kilopascals. Absolute. We, we calculated those right up here. Here's P2, here's P1. So you can see that P1 has a higher pressure than that one. And uh, we didn't calculate it, but the stagnation pressure would be this one. And it would be the highest pressure that we have. And then the process in going from 1 to 2 was isentropic, so it's along the same constant entropy line, which is just a vertical line here. So this is what the process looks like on a TS diagram. It's pretty straightforward. Again, these diagrams are, are often helpful just for visualizing the flow, and, and they just kind of help you double check that the numbers make sense, that T1 should be higher than T2 and P1 should be higher than P2. Um, it just, it's just a quick visual check. Okay, I think that covers everything we, we needed to for this example, so we'll just end it there.